also kind enough to join us on Twitch. So just search 670 The Score on Twitch, and you can see Trent Dilfer talking Justin Fields with us on this Horizon Therapeutics Bears Monday. Trent, thank you so much for the time. How are you doing today? Doing good. I enjoy that entire career highlight package as the opening. <laughs> yes, yes. We will relive the entire career each and every week. <laughs> Thank you for not playing longer and having more success so we could keep it Seriously. tight. Seriously. You know? Yeah, keep it to 90 seconds. It's perfect. Um, <laughs> it was an interesting game uh, for Justin Fields. What were your evaluations when you watched the tape? So first half, I uh, thought he really struggled with his timing just his eyes were out of whack. Uh, it was tough conditions, too. I mean, I do think all this uh, is under the umbrella of really sloppy, hard conditions to throw the ball and, uh, and to be precise. But just look kind of out of sync. What I appreciated the most about the game was his no-flinch mentality. That as bad as it was going early, and it was really bad, you didn't see that kind of shell shock look in his eyes. Uh, and actually, you kind of saw it with Trey Lance. You know, you saw Trey having some of that, wow, this is overwhelming, things aren't going well, I expect to have more success. With Justin, it was kind of a workman's matter-of-fact approach. And then in the second half, to be able to make the, the few plays he made, I mean, it's not like he lit the field up, but he made some really critical plays in the second half that tells me he didn't let the game, the, the failures, the challenges get – bigger than the job at hand, which was try to find a way to get a completion and a first down and, and get this thing going. So that's interesting. So the mentality of it, you could see, and you know how important that is to have. And the way he talked about it after the game, Trent, it sounds like he's bought in fully um, with this coach and is, has a very comfortable relationship. How important is that to keeping that poise that you're discussing? I think it's huge because you got to feel as if when things aren't going well, that the sideline isn't blaming you. You know, that the sideline is like, okay, there's reasons things aren't going well, and it's not only the quarterback. And I think it starts with the run game with the Bears. For, for the Bears to have any success offensively and for Justin to continue to grow, I think we talked about this last week, they're going to have to establish some consistency in the run game. That doesn't mean they have to be dominant in the run game, but the run game has to be a threat because everything is going to come off that run game for them. Um, so when things aren't going well, you have things to point at to get it fixed. Um, and as a quarterback, you're like, hey, I'm willing to, to walk the hard road in this game. Right, I'm willing to go down this hard road today. It's not going to be easy. I just want to make sure that everybody understands that it's this thing's going to be ugly at times. It's going to be sloppy, but but I got the poise. I got the command. I'll get this thing figured out. And if it's making a play or two in the third or fourth quarter to get us the lead, then that's what I'll do today. That's what the job today is. There'll be plenty of games where they get it going and he'll be able to light it up and receivers will be open and throwing conditions are perfect. But when it's tough, you need the quarterback to make sure that he's in for a tough day. He understands how to handle that day, and the sideline and the rest of the team understand that as well. The roll left, throw right, Dante Pettis yeah. wide open, no one within 16 yards of him. It's a, it's an unconventional touchdown, to, to say the least. What should we uh, extrapolate from it, if anything? Well, I think, one, how he gets out of it. You know what I mean? Just his athleticism is poised uh, to kind of get out of the junk in the pocket to get to his left. And then to stay as a passer first. I, I, you know, I used to work with Steve Young Monday night, and Steve would always be talking about quarterbacks and their mobility that they have to, as they're getting out of trouble and as they're attacking the line of scrimmage, scrimmage they have to stay in a passing posture. And I appreciated learning that from Steve that, you know, when you see Justin get out of there to the left, he's immediately getting to a passing posture. He knows he can run. He knows at some point he can go run. He did some nice things with his legs. But when you attack with a passing posture, now your eyes are downfield. You're scanning the field. And, you know, plastering in the secondary, that's what they call it, you know, out-of-system plays, third reaction plays, and the defense is scrambling. They're trying to plaster receivers and find them because the timing of the play is off. That's one of the hardest thing for secondaries to do. So as you escape the pocket and as you're getting out there on the perimeter, if you're attacking – in that passing posture, you've just broken down the secondary's ability to plaster completely because they're worried about you as the runner. They've lost receivers, and you'll see a lot of times these guys break open like that. So I think you're going to see a lot of that. It may be how the Bears generate some of their bigger plays is him out of system. We call it third reaction. His third reaction, first reaction is timing. Second reaction would be a sudden move in the pocket where you're making one guy miss climbing 
third reaction is when you've made a second reaction and now you're out on the perimeter. That third reaction passing game for the Bears may be one of the more explosive things they do because of how hard Justin is to handle in the pocket. Well, that that's exactly where we wanted to get as part of the conversation. As we're analyzing him, what'd you say, out of system? We've heard it called off schedule and on yep. schedule, that yep. kind of thing. Him as a scrambler slash playmaker, he clearly can be special with that, changing the arm angles on stuff. He shovels a ball yep. to David Montgomery at yep. one point. Um, yep. But evaluating him as a pocket passer, where he's just back there, and trying to go through the reads and make the right call and deliver at the right timing, should we be analyzing those things separately? Is is it is it fair to him to separate those as we analyze, or do we have to think about them all the same? No, I think I think it's fair to put it in buckets. Um, you know, I think the whatever term you want to use, off schedule, third reaction, out of system, doesn't really matter. All means the same thing. Um, I think his buckets can be very full. Okay, so I think that's going to be a really full bucket. That, that's going to be one that. Uh, you're not hoping for, but you know that it's lightning in a bottle and that a handful of times a game, uh, he's going to be able to do those things. I think the bucket is pretty empty right now when it, co- when it comes to the in-the-pocket timing rhythm stuff. It doesn't mean it can't fill up. Please hear me correctly. Mm-hmm. That stuff actually can be trained on a weekly basis. Some of that is scheme. Some of that is you got to feel comfortable with the concepts you're running and there's got to be a rhythm and a timing between your drop, the receivers getting open, separation between receivers and secondary, what coverages you're seeing. I mean, I could talk football nerd all day about this stuff, but there is some nuance to that. Um, I think I mentioned last week, some of the quick game stuff, I think he's, he's going to struggle with. That is, those are split millisecond decisions, spacing, anticipation, leverage. Those things can be take some time to learn. Um, but I do think they can find some some ways of keeping him in the pocket, extending his drop, letting him see it a little bit more, and using his arm talent to get the ball to the far edges of the football field. Um, but I, yeah, I do think as we evaluate him all year long, we should speak in one mentality. I think the stuff is the most important thing for a quarterback. So the stuff is mentality, poise, command, leadership resolve, grit, all those things. That's the stuff. All great ones have the right stuff. So we look at that every week. We look at the bucket of uh, traditional drop back pocket passing. And then we look at the bucket of playmaker. Maybe that's what the third bucket's called. And I think he's going to thrive in the stuff bucket. I think he's going to thrive in the playmaker bucket. I think we're going to see some ebb and flows with the uh, rhythm, timing, traditional pocket packers, pa- oh. passer stuff. Yeah, okay, that's great. that's great. That's exactly where we wanted to get. Yeah, so now, so in that traditional bucket, as we're talking to Trent Dilfer, and he's going to join us 4 o'clock on Horizon Therapeutics Bears Monday. He's vowed to watch the film with Justin Fields and then join us to make us smarter about what we are seeing here. Uh, we'll start with the bad, the interception, uh, and there was others that could have been interception. Tayshawn Gibson dropped one as, as well. But the, the one that actually was picked off, they showed the behind the quarterback angle on the TV broadcast and the throw didn't make any sense. D- did you see what he saw or didn't see, Trent? It was it was an odd throw. It was disturbing. Yeah, and I, I want to be careful every week. If I understand a concept, if I know exactly what he's supposed to be looking at, I will say that. Uh, there's going to be times that I'm not in their playbook. You know what I mean? I don't know what he was taught. And I'll use more of a generalization of it, and I'll use a generalization here. That's why I led by saying his his eyes looked very cluttered early. He looked like he wasn't looking at the right things at the right time. And when you do that, all of a sudden you're going to make these bonehead decisions. You're going to throw it right to the other team because you, you've practiced it all week with one rhythm to your eyes and your feet and a spacing, a timing to it all. And all of a sudden you speed that up with your eyes and nothing looks the same. And in the NFL, um, you know, it's such split second changes in defenses that if your eyes aren't right, you're going to do those things. So I'm going to put that one in more of the generalization bucket. There'll be weeks where I'll say, hey, he was reading a double air concept there with something underneath. He's supposed to key this guy. He doesn't key that guy right, makes a bad decision. I wasn't totally sure on that concept, but you could just see with his eyes and his feet and the timing of the play that he was all out of sorts. We wanted to just play for you what Fields said afterwards uh, on the interception. Um, 
to, to see if this sheds any light on it. Here, here's Fields trying to explain what happened. One thing was the first pick that I threw. Um, they were in three, three hook week. The safety came down. Um, I saw Mooney opening up. I tried to move Fred. He was a front side hook defender with my eyes the right way. But that back side hook defender, like I said before, they play the vision and break defense. So once that back side hook defender saw my eyes go right, then he came over a little bit. The safety did. Then that's 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 why they got the pick. But um, so that I just gotta you know just read the squeeze off of that and um just 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 make a better decision. But uh, other than that, you know, I felt like you know the, of course there were some uh, bad plays and of course some good plays. But I think you know the team as a whole you just just fought through adversity the the whole game. What do you think, Trent? That makes a lot of sense, actually. Next time, played the sound clip first. <laughs> we actually <laughs> talked about wh exactly how to do it. Wanted to give you the opportunity to say what you saw and then add fields. That's so funny you said that. Well, but it's actually really, it's really good because what I viewed as his having bad eyes, he just explained he was trying to look a guy off. And sometimes you spend so much time trying to look a guy off, trying to manipulate a defender, you forget like the golden rule of, well, where's the other defender? Um, I call it lizard eyeing. When we talk to our quarterbacks here and when we teach them around the country, we talk about having lizard eyes. You know how one eye for a lizard can be looking to the right and the other one can be looking to the left? Yeah. Uh, it's the same thing. The, the, the wider scope you have uh, with your eyes, the less that's going to happen to him. So the instruction I would give him there is great. Manipulate a defender with your face mask. Like if you point your face mask at him, he's going to think you're looking at him. But your eyes actually can be holding that backside guy or IDing the backside guy to make sure that backside hook defender isn't where you're going with the ball. So um, that makes a lot of sense. He actually articulated that really well, that squeeze defender is a big deal when you're throwing the ball in the middle of the football field. So um, I appreciate the fact that he can process that right away. He'll learn from it. And I think if I were to give him any advice, not that he's going to call and ask me, but uh, just having a broader scope of the underneath defenders with your eyes and using your face mask a little more than your eyes to look guys off is something I learned later in my career that was really helpful. See, there you go. All right, so lesson learned. We had one more we wanted to play for you. This is Justin Fields talking about the touchdown to Equinemius St. Brown. He was originally asked about uh, Byron Pringle as an extra receiver in that route. Did you consider Pringle at all? So he's got open as well to the side. Pringle? Yeah, yeah. He had the. Uh, he was on the backside, right? Yeah, he's my last read on that. So uh, my read on that is just the flat to the corner into the uh, mesh coming across into the backside guy. So um, I mean that was my second read. I felt the defenders come down soft, and then saw EQ. He took a good angle with that safety right there, and um, just 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 hit him for the touchdown. And of course the O line did a great job protecting that play. So proud of those guys. So is that a good moment for that bucket of uh, pocket passer that you're talking about? Really good because it's kind of, it's, I wouldn't call it a complex read, but it's a difficult read in the sense that you're reading kind of leverage and spacing of vertical uh, defenders if they get too shallow. So we're not talking width, horizontal spacing. We're talking vertical spacing, to, low to high, high to low. And a lot of times it's hard as a young player to, to recognize – the difference between six yards and nine yards, four yards and six yards in terms of spacing. And what he said there is he, he felt the vertical spacing change of the flat defender, which took him to that read. And um, it's a concept a lot of people run, and you see a lot of quarterbacks leave it too early because they're unsure of the vertical spacing. So, yeah, I thought that was a really good moment in the drop back bucket. I also appreciate, gave credit to his offensive line because it's one that you do have to protect for a while. Like, if you're going to really – kind of read that concept and even get all the way backside, like you talked about being a pure progression where he's going to come back to the backside if the front side isn't open. You really got to have a nice pocket and confidence that you have the chance to get all the way through your progression. Is there something, too, that was probably his best throw from the pocket and it came off of play action for a guy like Justin Fields? <laughs> Absolutely, and I think that's going to be a huge theme. And and my, my all-22 has been down for a couple weeks, so I've only seen the TV copy. But when I start watching the All-22, I think I'll be able to give specific examples of why. So fans aren't just saying, hey, play action better than drop back. I think, I'll, I think if I can learn their scheme well enough, which I should be able to, I'll be able to show you some specific reasons why the action pass is going to help him from the pocket. The, the biggest like um, broad strokes reason for it is because it – if you're a really good play action team, it activates or slash triggers. Triggers probably a better word. It triggers inside 
pass defenders into the run game. So you somewhat eliminate them from your early read. So think of the quarterback turning his back to the line of scrimmage, flashing the ball, old Peyton Manning stuff, and then pulling out of the belly of the back. Well, those two inside backers now trigger because they have to come downhill in the run game. Well, by doing that, you've also eliminated them from being early droppers into the hook zones, right? Those inside passing zones. And a lot of times, even if they trigger and then say they're really good athletes, a la Derek Brooks or Ray Lewis or the best linebackers, even those guys, after they trigger, well, they turn in their they turn their backs to the quarterback to run to get to their zone drops. Well, we always say if, if the linebacker's not looking at you, he can't pick it off. So you can whiz it right by his ear, you can throw it over his helmet, you can throw it over his shoulder. And he's not in a position to break on the ball. So I'm a huge believer, and I, I played much better this way. A lot of young quarterbacks, the Peyton Man, the Hall of Famers, Tom Brady early in his career was mainly a play action passer. Early in your career, the more play action, hard run action stuff you can do to trigger those underneath defenders to eliminate some of that clutter. Hmm. that a young passer doesn't want to see is definitely the best way to throw the ball. And there we go. That's what they're doing. And that's not what uh, what happened last year. I remember Ray Lewis and those Ravens teams, those Brian Billick Ravens teams, they were carried by the quarterback, though. It, that's what everyone said about them. We, we, we yeah. were very quarterback-centric in that 2000 team. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Le- led with the pass. Like <laughs> I-, I hope all the young kids that have never – know anything about that team, uh-huh. please know that that team was carried by the quarterback. 100%. 100%. Yes. Hey, um, does rotating an offensive lineman, Trent Dilfer, like they did with the right guard yesterday, yeah. does that have any negative effects at all on the quarterback to be you know, noticing a different guy there time after no, time? Not at home. Uh, on the road with snap count stuff in loud stadiums, yes. Um, I'm actually doing it this week with my team. It's the first time I've ever done it. I'm rotating a left tackle. They're both really good players. It isn't because of a weakness. It's because I, I have six really good ones. Um, I would not do it if I was like in college and we're playing at UT or something. And there's 100,000 people in crowd noise. So I'd be concerned with crowd noise because there's this intuitive feel with the ball being snapped and cr- with crowd noise and the guard moving with the ball and I would be, I would personally, I'm a risk management guy. I'd be scared of pre-snap penalties doing that on the road. What did you think overall of, uh, of the protection that, that you could see? I, I think they used max protect and chip help quite a yeah. bit on the edges to help. Well, the they kids. only threw, they only threw it 17 times, right? I think he was 11 for 17. Is that correct? He would that, no, he was uh, eight for 17, eight for 17, eight for 17. Yep. Yeah. So they only threw it 17 times. Um, yeah, I definitely think they had a protection plan. I mean, that's a very active defensive front uh, with some – they don't blitz a ton, but when they blitz, they're creative blitzes. Uh, I, I think that was a very well thought out, and it almost backfired because they got nothing going in the first half, but that was a – we are not going to expose Justin to chaos with five, six-man protections, with him not ex- understanding who's going to be blocked, who's not going to be blocked. Also, our matchups aren't great – uh, they want the Bears wanted that game in the teens. You know, what I mean, that's a yep. game that as they're game planning, they're like, this has to be a teens game. If this gets into a 20s or 30s a game, we're in trouble. So now I don't think that's going to be a plan every week. I think the biggest mistake fans make when you have a when you have a growing offense, okay, let's just call it a growing offense, is they go, Oh my gosh, this is gonna be this all year long. Like we're never gonna make plays. Every game is gonna be 17 to 10 or whatever it is. Yeah, your hard games are going to be that way. <laughs> like against really good teams, that's how you're going to have to play to win. But you'll have matchups where you can be a little more open. There's better opportunities for downfield plays. The matchups on the defensive line are favorable for your offensive line. But that was a game. I mean, what were they? I didn't look before the game. What were they? Three point home dogs or something like that? Seven. 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 Yeah. Well, exactly. You're a seven point home dog, man. That's a big number in the NFL. Um, I think everybody expected the Niners to win that game and for it to be tough sledding for the Bears. So for them to do that, 
that's a big thing. I certainly did, Trent. I'm getting oh, killed for it. I got I got three homers with me on this show. They're hey, like, oh, they all hey, picked the Bears. Hey. And they're like, oh, Parkins, you're a huge I, hater. I watched the preseason, Danny. Okay. I saw that this dude. I saw the Niners in two of the last three NFC Championship uh, yeah. games, Matt. Well, I know. Well, thank you. But, like, they're, they were very well coached. They're all buying into this hits principle, Trent. They're, like, they're playing discipline. They're hustling. They're intense. And what are, what else are they doing? They take the, way, the ball smart. and they play smart situations. Take H-I-T-S. 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 So, yeah. so listen, guys, I, I'm actually probably the perfect guy as a journeyman quarterback to do this this year with you guys because I did this in Tampa. So we li- I lived this. Ah. I went in night when Tony Dungy took over. Ah. It was this is the formula to winning. And it takes all 53 to buy into it. You got to put your egos on the back burner. You got to really go collegiate with your approach. Mm-hmm. And the collegiate appro- approach is – you know, we're all in this together. It's not about Pro Bowls. It's not about stats. It's not about contracts. It's about turning this ship around. And we did it with discipline and togetherness and grit and toughness and running to the football and playing well in fourth, knowing that every game was going to come down to a one score game in the fourth quarter. <laughs> and we had to be the team that owned that, uh, owned that scenario. And we started off one and seven. And nobody jumped off the ship. And then we turned it around in 96, 97. We go to the playoffs and win a playoff game. We have a billion of us go to the Pro Bowl. And, you know, eventually that group, not me, but that group wins the Super Bowl. So it's it's a great formula to turn a program around. The thing to be aware of is the locker room. Can the stars handle that? Can you be a dude? and not get the recognition of the other dudes in the NFL. That's the biggest one that you fight because egos are so big in the NFL. And the Warwick Duns and myself and, you know, the guys that, you know, we wanted to be highlighted players when you just became a become a role player, and that's what you are, you're a role player, to a big play that's going on. Um, it, you have to adjust your mentality a little bit, but if you buy into it, there's magic there. Trent, great stuff. Congratulations on 4-0 with uh, Lipscomb Academy. Good luck with the rotating left tackles. Yeah, we'll and, check back in. And uh, so it's a Sunday night game next week, so I'm not sure if you'll be able to have the film, but whatever it is, we'll either talk to you next uh, Monday or Tuesday to go over Bears and Packers, all right? I'll be ready to rock. All Thanks, right. Trent. Thank you, Trent. See you guys.